ladies and gentlemen. Joining us today is one of the most badass fighters on the planet. The two-time WBC Muay Thai World Champion, the 2016 Combat League World Champion, among other titles. He's a promoter, he's a beauty, and he's none other than the man, the myth, the legend. Liam, the hitman, Harrison. How's it going today, man? Thank you so much for making Hi, time mate. for us. No, no problem, mate. Thank you for inviting me on. Uh, all good here. Uh, the weather's shite in England, but... Other than that, I've got no complaints. Yeah, I live in Minnesota, so it's damn cold uh, here yeah, as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. um, before we uh, kind of you know dive into your story, your career, I just have to say the timing of us connecting today actually worked out perfect given the amazing fights that we saw over the weekend. Um, not to mention actually a regional MMA promotion out here starting Muay Thai. But again, before we get into uh, your story, I want to know, what are your thoughts on this last weekend? Like, one championship, 165, the kickboxing fights on the cards. What, what, what's your uh, thoughts on, you know, let's start with the Ray Patrick fight, uh, Marat Gregorian, and then, of course, Superlek. With the, with the first one you mentioned, the heavyweight? Yes, sir. Mate, I don't know, I can't remember his name, but that big giant heavyweight, the really tall one, he was sharp. Um, he had such a good left body kick, he... Uh, I forgot the Iranian one's name, but I like him. It makes me laugh. I forgot what he's called. What's he called? The, the smaller one. Azizpour. Yeah, Azizpour. Yeah, uh, I enjoy watching him. He's usually looks really dangerous. He's a heavy puncher, but again, we saw this twice yesterday where the kicker took the puncher's game totally away from him, and that the big tall one, his his left kick to the body and across the arms was, it, it just put Azizpour off completely. He didn't want to come in. He didn't want to engage. He was scared to let anything go. Um, and he had some really, really nasty, sharp kicks in it. It was, it was refreshing to see a guy that big still have that really nice, crisp, fast, lush technique. Uh, that I, I enjoyed watching him. That was the first time I've, I've actually watched him fight. And uh, yeah, he's, he's one to watch out for, for sure. Yeah, no, that one was a lot of fun. Um, and, and you were totally right. Like the distance... And the kicking kept Aziz Poor at range, and we all know Aziz Poor when he gets into the pocket, he's got the, he's got that big Iranian strength that can take you out with a single punch. So, I mean, after the first round, his body already bruised up there. I was like, oh man, this is this is not the game plan that uh, that he wanted going into that one. Yeah, well, he went he went red raw straight away. His arms, his ribs, and he wasn't really making any attempts whatsoever to block the the kicks. Um, I think he was just going to try take them and then just fire back with punches. But after he took the first two. I think he thought, shit, this guy can fucking kick hard yeah. and fast and sharp. And he had good movement as well for a big heavyweight guy. He wasn't just stood in one spot trying to load up with power. I enjoyed his movement. I enjoyed how sharp and crisp everything was. It was a, it was a nice performance. Oh, absolutely. All right, let's talk about Murat and Sidichai. I know they fought many times before. Uh, what were your thoughts on that matchup? Yeah, it, it was sad to see this because I, I was speaking to my friend, JP Gallagher, who was uh, who, uh, Nico Carrillo's trainer. I was speaking to him yesterday about it I think and I said oh I said it's looking to me like City tries finished I said I hope I'm wrong because he's had a great career but his last two or three fights he's just he's slowed down so much and I and I could see and I could see him you know, slowly declining declining his last couple and then his last fight he lost and got dropped by someone who would have never dropped him a couple of years back I don't think that fight would have laid a, a single glove on him a couple of years back so I was sort of like hoping, even though I like Gregorian and I like his style and he's exciting to watch, I was sort of hoping City Chai could turn back the clocks and prove me wrong, but he didn't. He um, he looked slow. He didn't look like his defence were there. He couldn't weather the same amount of punishment that he could do before. And I, it was sad to see, really, because he was such an elite-level operator in both Muay Thai and kickboxing um, to watch his last few fights where he slowed down this much. And obviously he's had a lot of fights and he's been involved in a lot of wars and it happens to you, you just slow down out of nowhere sometimes and I think that's what just we've seen with City Chai in the last couple of fights. I think fighting at the level there is on one championship, if he wants to carry on fighting maybe he's going to have to drop it down and step away from one championship and take some easier fights abroad or something like that because on one championship now it's just full of killers. And I don't want to see him take on any unnecessary punishment and get stopped and ruin his legacy because he's uh, he's been a great servant to to kickboxing and Muay Thai. No, you said it there, and it and it, it was a little sad, and especially because of that first round, it seemed like okay, his his defense is crisp. We we saw like the old Sidich in that first round, but then second round on, like you said, he got cracked a couple times, and it was just like, oh no, we we know how this is going to end. 
Yeah, he just started to fall apart under the pressure, and that's something that we've never seen him do. But it's happened his last couple of fights in a row now. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if he can, how he's going to come, how he can come back from this, especially at the level on one championship. Because when you're in the top five in that division, who is there? There's of the champion, Gregorian, Superbon, Tawan Chai doing kickboxing now. How is he meant to fight any of them guys if he's if he's slowed down? Do you know what I mean? So unless one championship are going to be a bit nicer to him and give him a few easier fights before he retires, I just don't see how he's going to be able to live at that level anymore. Yeah, I mean, and that's a murderous row of guys at the top of that division, 100%. All right, well, let's focus on Superlek here for a minute. I mean, a lot of people seem to doubt him going into his last two fights, respectfully against Rod Tang and now against Takeru. From a veteran like yourself, an expert and a fighter's perspective, what makes Superlek so damn special? And do you think he's finally arrived, so to speak, on more of a global scale, not just within the, the smaller Muay Thai community? Well, he's always been here, do you know what I mean? And he's always been an elite level fighter. And anyone who knows what they're actually talking about knows this. The most, honestly, my biggest fucking pet peeve in life is reading the shit. I love one championship, but they have created this whole army of absolute lunatics who think fucking Rod Tang is the greatest fighter on planet Earth. And they can't see past anything that Rod Tang does. And people like Superlek and Takaru getting overlooked. Um, before the Rod Tang fight, the amount of fucking people are saying, yeah, Rod Tang's the greatest ever, he'll destroy him and this and that. And then the amount of people that are reading in this this build-up to this fight saying, oh, it's a good job Rod Tang's pulled out because he'd have destroyed uh, Takaru in one round and all this. And I'm thinking to myself, when the fuck has Rod Tang ever destroyed anyone in one room round? He couldn't even beat Edgar Tabarez in one round and everyone else did. So how have these people become so delusional? They can't see past any of this. I don't, I don't get what I'm, I'm getting angry thinking about it now. And I, I find myself getting caught up arguing with him sometimes and that. And I'm just like, I have a day off. And the amount of people who actually thought Rod Tang beat Superlek, why can't any of them just learn how to score in Muay Thai? It'll take you 10 minutes. Just sit yep. down and learn how to have a little read and learn how to do it. It'll take you 10 minutes. Um, it, but it's so frustrating. But the thing is now as well, I put some on yesterday about how great I fought Superlek. I've, I've always been, I've trained with him a lot, Superlek. He's been one of my gym partners when I've been at Yokao. We've done a lot of rounds together. We've trained together. We've sparred together. We've done fight camps together. Uh, and I class him as a good friend. So when I put up yesterday about how good I actually think it was and how great it is to see him doing well, he, uh, a lot of people just jumped on and there were some of the comments straight away were, well, uh, he got robbed again. Rob Tang got robbed against Superlek. I'm like, oh my God, just have a day off, man. It's, it's insane, but yeah, going back to that performance in that fight, hats off to both of them because that was the one of the big, biggest show of hearts, not just from Takarek, who got Takaru, sorry, who got his leg absolutely blown to smithereens, but Superlek were uh, on his way out in round three. He got hurt with a body yep. kick in round three, and I spoke to one of my friends who was with him in the hotel room yesterday, and I said like, oh, ask him what happened in round three, and he said he put his hands down to try and let him punch him in the face. So he stopped punching him in the body. That's how, that's how that's how badly he was hurt to the body. So listen, when you've got people in, in the ring, they are two seriously, seriously tough guys. I have never, ever seen anyone in my entire life take the punishment Takaru took yesterday. I know his leg got destroyed, but in round five, he was taking some of the most horrendous long knees I've ever seen as well. And you could see they were almost folding him, but he just wouldn't give up. So, yeah, I think um, well, that was an absolutely incredible fight for the fans. That uh, we, we all got absolutely treated there. So, hats off to both of them too. Hats off to one championship for making the fight happen uh, because I thought that were incredible. And I think that were... Uh, I think... Uh, if, it, if Takaru and Rod Tang fight, I don't see how Rod Tang beats him under that rule set because he ain't got the... He ain't as fast as Superlek. He ain't got the movement Superlek's got. And I think, will he just stand in front of Takaru and just try and trade with him? And that might be a bit suicidal, really, because I thought Superlek, his game plan was, for the first, until he got hurt, his game plan was perfect. His jab was fucking absolutely spot on. His leg kicks, he was moving. Um, his head movement was brilliant. I thought everything about his performance until he got hurt was spot on. And then how he, how he came back in round four and five after he was hurt was... Uh, testament to how much of a, a, a an elite level operator he is well oh, absolutely everything you said about you know the fans just clamoring over rod tang and 
and also not taking time to look up how Muay Thai scored. I mean, that's music to my ears because I I'm the one waving that flag as well. Even all my friends are like, no, no, Rod Tang won that one. I'm like, dude, like, watch the fight, read the rules, and you'll see why this you know why this kid is special. And I say kid, so he's 27 years of age, and I know you know Thai fighters they start very very young. But uh, he's he's still got a lot of gas left in the tank, and I cannot wait to see what's next for Super. Like both in Muay Thai and now in kickboxing, crazy enough. And the, and when I was watching that fight too, especially in the fifth round, all I was thinking of was a both these two guys are warriors, and b thank God for Takeru. This isn't Muay Thai because if Super like had elbows also in his arsenal, oh my goodness! Would, I don't think he had got past two rounds if he had yeah. elbows. When no, he's, he's if a kickboxer tries to come in and box. Someone like super super like that, like his elbows are so dangerous. He'll just he fires that spear elbow straight through the middle so fast when he's fighting under Muay Thai rules in the four rounds gloves. I think he'd have cut Takaru to pieces, to be honest. Um, but I, I saw a chat he posted something this morning saying that Takaru had said he wants to try Muay Thai, so it'll be interesting because he's, he's a good boxer. If he can, if he gets room to unload in them four rounds gloves, he's going to be dangerous. But against someone like Superlek who's got elbows, might be a bit. Uh, bit of a not of a, a wise choice to be fair yeah Takeru, he's got the power for sure but uh like you you made a tweet or a, a post on instagram that said you know the best striker in the world uses all their tools it's different than the best boxer in the world and i, I couldn't agree more all right let's uh let's turn the page here what are some of the biggest differences um slash how you find today's top thai fighters and the scene compared to the original thai scene uh, that you competed in you know competing against the senchai sing and dom popcorn etc this is a new era, uh, so I fought all the all those ties under the the proper traditional Muay Thai rule set, traditional Muay Thai rule scoring, five five rounds, three minutes, um, eight ounce gloves. Like today, because it's like it's like a different sport. This it's three rounds, it's fast, it's hard. And you, it, you don't have to be that technically good to be to get ahead in this this rule set with the four ounce Muay Thai gloves and stuff like that. You have to be fit, you have to be tough. And if you've got power, you're going to go far. Um, there's some quite, like you see these fights on one championship on a Friday afternoon. The technical game has just gone out the window and it just comes down to an absolute war. And it's like, who wants it most? Who's got the best chin? Who, who can land a bomb first in them four ounce gloves? So yeah, it's, it's a completely different sport, but it, it's, it's exciting. It's uh, And it's getting a lot more casual fans involved because there's a lot of like MMA casuals who watch MMA but don't watch Muay Thai just because they like the small gloves and they like the stand up and they like knockouts and so a lot of my fans who will never really sorry a lot of my friends who would never really watch Muay Thai I've got them into one championship and they love it because they're all big MMA fans and they, they love the four ounce glove style um, it's nice to see things like IWS that still got the traditional five rounds but even though they've changed things up a bit They've got people fighting for Rajid Amnon titles and they're not even having to weigh in on the morning of the fight. That's bullshit. The, the stadium titles like that should not have been changed. If you want to be a stadium champion in Thailand, you should have to do it how it's been done for, throughout the ages. You weigh in on the morning of the fight at 6am, you come back and you fight that night. It's, it's just been like, how has sort of like watered it down so more foreigners and I think they can reach like a global stage. I get that, but they shouldn't be changing things like that. It's um, And I've seen there's still quite a few Petch and D shows and things like that going on where those are all still the traditional weighing on the morning, which is nice to see that those shows are still around because there's certain fighters who've tried to cross over to one championship and they just haven't had the, had the success. So if you're a female style, a technician, and you get sent to one championship, you're going to struggle. We saw it happen with Sangmani. Gauna has had an absolute horrendous time just getting his lights punched out every time he's tried to do it. We've seen it happen to a lot of them that they're just their styles, and they've been some of the best stadium fighters over the last 10 years, in my opinion, those two. But they've gone over to one and they just haven't been able to, it hasn't worked for them. So it, they still need like options if they're going to carry on fighting. I know Sangmani's retired and he's in Singapore, but yeah, if there's any technicians like that, they still need to have these big stadium fights and need things like RWS and stuff. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting time and there's a lot of good fights to be made and exciting fights. But, yeah, it's, it's a lot different to to what I was doing when I was like in my prime and fighting these guys. 
I really do love how some of the traditional stadium promotions, though, are in this digital age streaming these events for free on YouTube, right? It's not just on, you know, one championships Friday fights. You can you can find a lot. And it's not just on DAZN with RWS. Like there's there's options and it's available for a lot of people in North America to watch, too. So even though things are changing and things are becoming modern, it's still cool to see that, you know, the traditional rule set, those traditional stadium shows are still being broadcasted to the world so everyone can still see the the originals where it came from and you know what it's becoming here today which is super cool let's switch gears and, and talk about you a bit sir um how did you get into sport the, the sport in particular and where did your fighting career start um when i was 13 i was playing a lot of pro football i was at quite a good level when i was younger um that's that's soccer for you guys over over that side uh, english football um and my cousin Andy Alson, he, he he's also he's one of my my main trainers now, and he went on to become a five time world champion himself. He was a good fighter. He uh, just said, "Oh, I've just started at this new gym. Excuse me, bad company gym down uh, in Leeds." He said, "Do you want to do want to come down and give it a try?" And I said, "Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, we lived in a bit of a rough area, so there were always like fights going on in the street and at school and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, yeah, go down there, learn how to fight a bit, um, because I'd never even heard of what." Muay Thai or Thai boxing war back then. This was, oh wow, 1999, I think. I was about 13. Yeah, no, 1998, I was 13. So, yeah, I walked into the gym then for like the, fir the first time. And I thought, like, Bad Company has been one of the best gyms in the UK for since 1992 it started. And when wow. I started in 1998, there were loads of British champions, European champions. And then when I walked in and I saw them all kicking pads and I got that smell of the liniment and stuff, and I, I were a bit like, I'm like, oh shit, this is fucking. I didn't know it was going to be like this. I thought it was going to be some like karate type shit or something. Do you know what I mean? I honestly didn't know what to expect. I thought I used to watch kung fu movies all the time, and I thought, yes, it's going to be like some mad, mad kung fu shit or something. And I walked in and I saw them blasting the pads and that smell of the liniment, and I, I got a bit like nervous. I'm like, oh wow, this is fucking serious shit. This, and then I were enjoying my training for the first month. And then it wasn't until the, my first month where I got to spar for the first time. Like the Richard let us spar, and, and me and Andy got to spar each other, and we just kicked fuck out of each other basically. And I remember thinking, yes, but this is sick. And then after six months, uh, I had a junior fight, and I hated it. Um, I, I had to wear all pads because I were only thirteen. I had to wear all pads and oh no, I just turned fourteen. I had all pads on and stuff like that, and I just I hated it. I won the fight, but I, just, I really didn't enjoy myself. And I just said to Richard, I went, no, let me, I said, I'm not doing that again. I said, let me fight it like the adults fight. And he was like, no, we can't. He said, you've got to be 16 in the UK. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not doing that again with all pads on. And my first fight, I was 60 kilograms. I was, I know, I was 14. And now I only fight at 65. So I've not really grown. I was a big 14 year old, and I just stopped growing straight <laughs> when I got to 14. Which were devastating, but yeah. Um, so yeah, it got, I got to like a, I were, it was like two weeks before my fifteenth birthday, and Richard went right. I've got this fight. We've got a, a sixteen-year-old here from, so it's going to be a pro fight. You'll get paid. And I'm like, oh my god! He said, you don't wear any pads, eight-ounce gloves. That's it. And I thought, yes. He said, right, but just lie when you've got to say you're sixteen. I went, yeah, sound. So I got to weigh in. I weighed in. And then I watched my opponent walk out and he jumped in his Golf GTI and drove off. And I'm thinking, this guy's not 16. I thought, how old is he? Um, it turned out he was nearly 20 year old anyway, but I knocked him out in first round. Wow. I got, I got paid 30 pounds, which is about $50. <laughs> and it was the greatest moment of my life. Imagine me, 14 year old, and someone, you've just knocked someone out and someone comes and gives you $50 in your hand. I was like, wow, wow, like, this is fucking unbelievable. Wow. That were it, that were it then. I was just hooked. Um, I was still playing football up until I was about 17, semi-professional level. Um, and then it got to the point where I was UK number one. I was fighting abroad when I was 17. And I just had to, had to let it go. Wow, what a story there. That's amazing. Um, who are some of your toughest opponents you faced in your career? So I went my first 29 pro fights unbeaten. And my 30th fight were against, I was 18 years old and I fought a Thai called Duao Kong Udom. And at the time, there was no YouTube, this was about 2004 or something like that, 2004, 2005, something like 2004 ish. It, yeah, and I remember I was about 18. It was just before my 19th birthday. So I was eight, yeah, well, I was 18. And then there were no like YouTube or all, you couldn't go in and just put this fighter's name in YouTube and everyone 
told me how good he was, but I'd knocked quite a lot of my previous opponents out, and I'd fought about three or four ties, and they were good ties, but they weren't stadium level, top ten champion level fighters. And this was the first, he was Omnoy champion, he was Azuzu champion, and the fight before me just beat Anawak House Amrit. And I didn't know all this at the time because I couldn't just jump on the internet and look. So I didn't really ask many questions. I just thought, yeah, I'll fight him, whatever, I'll knock him out, just same as all others. And then in, uh, in round two, I dropped him with a big left hook, and he got up and he beat me with an inch of my life, like absolutely <laughs> fucking battered me all over the place. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and that was that was like a. I became a man that day because I had a choice to make. It was either like, okay, what do I do here? Do I just stick around here and uh, pad out my record against these fighters who were good fighters, but not like elite level? I thought, how am I going to be able to compete with these guys? So when my nineteenth birthday came a month later, I just packed up and moved to Thailand for two years. So that were a, a, a good a good lesson that he gave me because he was tough and he absolutely, he absolutely battered me. Uh, and I remember thinking in round four, I couldn't hurt him anymore. He, he properly battered me. And I was thinking, well, you've made your bed here. You, you're not fucking, you can't quit. You've yeah. made your bed. You're fucking lying it. You take your beating uh, like a man. And then that's it. And that's what I had to do. I just had to just get, accept I was going to get battered. And I got battered. Um, so he, he was a really tough one. Um, as I've got older, Singdam Kiat Munani gave me a really grueling fight because I fucking starched his legs badly when we fought and I was so sure I was going to stop him um, but these them Kate Moon and boys that Superlex uncle thing down if anyone's wondering who that is uh, them Kate Moon and boys they're a different breed and they're so tough they can just take anything you give them and I was so sure I was going to stop him so that were a, a tough fight that were a really grueling fight Rod Leck, that were a crazy fight I, yep. I, I mean it though I took, three months before that fight I just had my first knee surgery and the doctor said to me do not go back to full training until 12 weeks. And now we're like, ah, fuck that, I've got a fight in 12 <laughs> weeks. So I did six weeks of knee rehab, and then I thought, oh shit, I better actually start training for this fight here. Oh my I God. trained for five weeks, and then went to Shanghai to fight Rod Lake, and I was just so, I just went on the, on the ball at all. It meant for a good fight, because I was just swinging around and trying to snap his leg off. But I would, and it showed how tough he was, but I was so like sharp and, my reactions and everything were just off, so off point in that fight. But yeah, he was tough. Very, very tough guy. Uh, Anawa, uh, very tough. He hit like an absolute train. Um, Hussein Banui as well, tough guy. That were a crazy war. There's been so many over the years. Mohamed Kamal, Fabio Pinker. There's been so many tough, tough guys. When you're fighting at the elite level in Muay Thai, you're not going to find anyone who isn't tough, I don't think. You're not going to find anyone who'll just back down and give up. Um, the elite level Muay Thai fighters, they, you you have to be accustomed to taking punishment at that level, and you have to like make a deal with yourself before the fight or before you even get to that level. You think right, if I'm going to be go any farther in this sport, I need to be able to take the because it ain't going to always go your own way. There's too many weapons coming at you. There's too many different styles. There's elbows, there's knees, there's clinches, there's heavy punches, heavy kickers. You have to make a deal with yourself that you're just willing to take the punishment as well as give it out because. If you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, and that's like one of the biggest differences between Muay Thai kickboxing and boxing. Not even just in North America, but worldwide. It's like there is no padding your record, you know, in in, in Muay Thai. If you want to fight at the highest level, if you want to get paid at the highest level, it's like you you said it there. You got to accept that you're going to take some pain. You're going to have to fight some savages, and you're going to have to accept some losses there for sure. And that's why when I show some of my friends and um, some of my combat sports friends who are more into MMA, more into boxing, they're like. What the hell? This guy has hundreds of fights and he has like fifty losses. It's like, have you seen who they're fighting? Look at look yeah. at the the record of their opponents as well at the highest level. It, it, there's there's no slouches. Um, and I and I know you love you know to go to war with the best of uh, the best out there. Other than uh, you know beating that sixteen year old, I mean twenty year old. Uh, <laughs> what what was one of your favorite fights that you competed in? Ooh, I've had a few. Um, I think I know what the second fight of Anawa. I enjoyed that one because. Uh, that that meant a lot to me. That one, that were a, a good win. I know what was. He was still Rajid Amnern champion at that point, and he battered me all over in the first fight. So when I when I beat him, that were a that were a good one. That were a big win. Uh, the Mung Thai fight was fun. The one fight of the year in twenty twenty, just because of how 
ridiculous it was. He knocked me down twice. I then knocked him down three times, all in the space of the first like minute and a half of the first round or something crazy that was. Uh, what else for a good one? I mean, I just mentioned there, Hussein Benoui. I really enjoyed that fight. That was uh, because it was just the one was technique going on. It was just fuck. We just absolutely laid into each other. That fight was really fun. That was uh, a fun one. <laughs> yeah, Andre Colby, and that were a good fight. I enjoyed that. that was a good performance from me on that part. Smashed his leg to pieces. Uh, Medis are two when I won the WBC world title. That were a good one. Uh, I've had so many over the years. Um, I enjoyed fighting Mali Pet over in America just because of how cocky he was. <laughs> he was like he was being really cocky and he was telling me everyone who was gonna knock me out and he was even saying he was gonna knock me out of this press conference and all this and I was thinking, yeah, whatever. And then he got in the ring and he, he was being so cocky in the first two rounds, but a bit I thought by round the end of round four I'd beaten that I beat it out of him that and he just stopped through all games and I won on points, that was quite fun. Uh, and there's, there's so many over years that uh, I forget sometimes and then sometimes a fight will just pop up. Uh, that I'll have totally forgot about and uh, I think, oh fucking hell, that were a good fight. But yeah, there's been there's been loads. Um, so what does life after competing look like for you? I know you're still you're still active, you're still you're still training, but uh, I know you're busy, you know, traveling the globe with seminars. I'll let you speak on that for sure here in a sec, but I also know that you own a promotion now. Shout out to Hitman Fight League, which is actually taking over the UK Muay Thai scene for those who don't know in less than a year, uh, a year no less. So congratulations on that, sir. How is it uh, how is it being a promoter, a coach, and what are some of the toughest things you have to deal with behind the scenes bo in both of those roles? You know, um, traveling the globe, running seminars, and now also being a fight promoter. Um, yeah, the promotion, I, I'm lucky with that. I've got such a good team who help me with it. The Hitman Fight League team is me, Andy Alton, Simon Jays, and Ricky Sewell. Um, and we've everyone like really pulls the weight and gets behind and helps. And everyone's got their own little part to play. And we absolutely smash it every time. Uh, and like you say, we've we've shot up and we've we're taking over the the, the UK scene at the minute. We're, we're just, we really wanted to, I, because of me and Andy especially, have been fighters. We've the, we've had nearly like two hundred fights between us. We fought all over the world. We know how we like to be treated on promotions, and we know like what it's like to be on a shit promotion and get treated like shit and get used and and all that. So we just try to stop all that and just try to make it as much for the fighters as possible. Obviously, we're working with one championship now to try and make opportunities for our fighters to get them over there so they can get paid properly. We're also working with Kieran Kettle over in Alberta. We're sending fighters over to him. We've got a big tournament coming up on this show, which then will go, the winner will go to Kieran's show. And then the winner of that will be have a one championship, $100,000 contract. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, obviously, I'm really busy with other stuff as well. So like, that's when the other guys in the in the team they come into it and they really fucking go to town on things like Ricky and Andy have been amazing for the, for this show that we're doing at the minute. Cause I'm I'm trying to train for a fight, but I don't know what's going on with it. I've been I've been told a day and then I've been told not and then I've been told an opponent and then I've been told I can't fight him. So I don't know what the fuck's going on at the minute. I feel like I'm I still try to keep myself fit and ready to go when they do tell me I'm fighting. If they are going to tell me I'm fighting, I just don't know what the fuck's going on to be honest. Um. But also, I've got to have my ear to the ground of what's going on with the show. We're all we all have to we're all in a big group chat. We try to sort the fights out in the matches. I've also got seminars. I'm in Colombia from the fifteenth of the to the twenty second of February. I've got two hours of seminars every single day in Colombia. Wow. I fly back home. I land on the twenty seventh night, twenty second night. I have to get straight to Manchester for the twenty third for the weigh in for the show. The show's then on the twenty fourth. So I'm going to be absolutely fucked by the the 25th. And then if I am fighting in the day I was told, I need to get straight back in the gym on the 25th, 26th and start getting to work. So yeah, it's tough. Um, but my brain, I, I, I need a lot going on. Otherwise, my brain, if my brain's not engaged with more than a couple of things, I, I start to get, it's a bit depressing. I don't like it. Um, which is why I've got all these things in place now for when I do have to retire from fighting because I know that's getting close. Because I don't, I don't want to be one of them guys who want to put stuff aside for his future and just not put anything in place. Because you see a lot of fighters getting depressed and it's not nice to see. They don't really know what to do with themselves because they've done it for so long. But yeah, hopefully I've, uh, I've got a good thing in place. My website, my seminars, my promotion. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'll be a bit gutted. Well, I will be very, very gutted when I have to stop fighting. It'll be, it'll be fucking shit, to be honest, because I don't know anything else. But... At least I've got other stuff to, to keep me busy.
Well, and it's good that you've settled that up now and it, 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 you're thriving with it now because that's the story with all professional athletes, not even, you know, not even just fighters. I mean, I see again, I'm a big uh, ice hockey guy being, you know, Canadian, got Don Cherry on my desk here. Um, and and a, a lot of hockey players too, who, you know, may not be, you know, the superstars in the respected league or who've been playing in the minors their whole life. And then suddenly it comes to an end. A lot of them don't have a lot of savings or don't have anything set up. And you just said it there. It's, it's super depressing, especially in a sport as brutal as hockey and as brutal as fighting, where you take a lot of damage too, and you, you need those support systems at the end of the day. So and that's really awesome to hear. And when I was, you know, prepping for this interview and then talking to some of, uh, some of your other fans too on, uh, you know, Muay Thai Twitter and things like that, uh, who, you know, told me that like, no, you, Liam's doing great stuff. You've told me about your seminars. So that's awesome to hear, sir. And it will be a sad day too from a fan, you know, when, when you do eventually hang up the gloves, but I'm excited. You still got a little bit of fight left in you. And uh, we're all excited to see when uh, your next fight uh, is announced. Just quickly on that relationship with one championship in regards to your promotion. Um, how did that kind of partnership transpire in regards to the tournament to get, you know, your fighters, the opportunity to get a contract with one championship? Cause it sounds like you do have a, a great, relationship with the promotion yeah uh, obviously me and chatry are friends good friends obviously he's the the big boss at one championship but we have a good relationship uh ricky sewell is one of the main referees for one championship you'll see him on friday fights every week he was out in japan judging on this show at the weekend so he's got a great relationship with those guys um and yeah it just it just made sense to like because we were speaking to some of the guys at one championship the matchmakers <laughs> excuse me, and some of the guys who run the Friday shows, you know, we're just like, what, how can we, shall we, let's get together, like, you've got me over here in England, you've got Ricky over here in England, let's get some UK talent scouted for you guys, and let's try and find a way where we can send them over, uh, it'll, we can work together, we can make more opportunities for our fighters over here, we can get some good level fighters over to you over there, and um, let's just see what we can do, and yeah, they, they seem to, to like the idea and stuff like that, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to, to see, I'm not I'd really, I'd really love to do. I like some of the fighters. We've got like an Irish guy who's come over and he's fought on all three of our first shows last year. And he's in the he's in the first tournament. No one knew who this kid was, but we've put him on all of our three shows and he's one by knockout on all three of them. He's really, really exciting. His name's Jay Council, and he's 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 a right little character. He's great on the mic. He's got a lot of character. He's like really bubbly he's got a lot of personality about him and he's like he's just made to be in front of the camera and to fight and stuff like that he's like a mini conor mcgregor really but he's so funny and he's full of energy and he's a solid little fighter so i'd love it if like someone like him could win that first tournament and then we've got him from our first show we've built him up he won the wm or european title on his last show and then if we can send him a one championship on this show i'd love that um just for a fight who just to pop up out of nowhere in the space of a year He's made a massive name of himself in England, and now if he can go do it on the world stage, I'd, I'd, uh, that'd be that'd be really cool. Um, but obviously, I just want to do that with all of our good level fighters. Like, if there's anyone going under the radar, let's get him as a platform to perform on. Let's get him out to one championship. Let's let's get him on these shows. Let's get all the world talking about him and knowing about him and and things like that. That's the goal. That's awesome to hear. And I, I for one, like, you know, I, I watch the, the highest level promotions. Obviously, I'm a fan of the sport, but I also love watching the regionals and seeing where these guys come from and seeing their development as well. So that's super exciting. And again, congratulations on all your guys' success uh, right out of the gate. Uh, last couple questions here, Liam. And again, really appreciate your time. Who are some of your favorite fighters of all time and obviously why. And in contrast, who are some of the best young prospects in the sport right now that we should be keeping our eyes on, um, you know, outside of my Canadian brother and champion, John DeBella, of course. Okay, so my favorite fighters, number one was Tong Chai, Torsila Chai. When I was coming up, he was the first person I ever saw use heavy punches, heavy leg kicks, and everyone was terrified of him. He was a little animal. He's the only person who ever knocked Sancho out as well, just in case anyone doesn't know who that is. Um, and I used to watch him and he heavy puncher, heavy leg kicker. And so I sort of like started modeling my style around him. And then obviously from him, I went on to watching Pontenay a lot. Pontenay Sitmon Chai. He was a, a, just a complete wild man. Legend, um, yeah. A wild man. I'm, I'm sure he shot someone over a chicken fight or something, didn't he? He's a wild lad. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he's in jail. I'm sure he is. Uh, he, that's how wild, of a wild man he was. He's insane. But yeah, his fights were crazy. And I used to love watching him because he was similar. Heavy puncher, heavy leg kicker. Um, now, in the present day, a sex hand's up there as well. Sex yeah. hand just for how crazy he fights. Um, 
Yeah, there's a lot of talk about me fighting him at the minute. I don't know what one championship I'm playing at. They need to fucking sign that, give me that contract and let me sign it and let me and him fight because we're both old and we're both in his last year of his career, I think. So I fought all the legends from this era. I fought the Pacorn, Sagatdale, Sanchai, Anoa, Jaren Sapke, Banchong. I fought all of them. Do you know what I mean? So if he's he's there at one championship, he's agreed to it as well. I put like a friendly call out on Instagram and he he put one back saying, yeah, let's do it. I'm ready for you. So I don't see why we, there's, there's two of us here ready to retire soon. Why can't we just fight each other before we retire? I don't get what's going on. If I were them, that the, it's got the old, whole Muay Thai world invested. Or like Everyone went crazy when I mentioned it on my Instagram. I got hundreds and hundreds of comments and inboxes about it and stuff. So I don't get why they don't even give us that contract. But anyway, that's a, another thing. Um... Superlek, obviously, as well. He's he's there now. He's he's the he's the main, main the main guy now. And a whack house Amri as well from a few years back. Uh, youngsters, Joe Ryan from England. Uh, he's Rajan Amnon champion at seventy two point five kilos. He's only about nineteen years old. Very very talented young man. Um, he, he'll go far in the sport. He's a really really good good level fighter. Uh, we've got a lot coming through our gym in, in the UK. A couple of them are out in uh, Thailand now fighting in the WBC World Championships. We've got Finley and Fergus from our gym, both very good level. Both of them are fighting on the Hitman Fight League on 24th of February as well. Um, so you can see a, a couple of them on there. Uh, like Freddie Haggerty, did you, did you see him at the, the weekend? He's very impressive on Earth. Nasty. Yeah, uh, and he's a lovely kid him as well. He's not a bell end like his brother is. Uh, <laughs> Brother's a prick, <laughs> um, but he's just a lovely kid. Uh, he's really, really down to earth, and I, I, I liked watching him fight because he had a tough time in that fight at first round, and he showed good level. Uh, there's a lot of guys where JP Gallagher is at Saw Denchapan as well, Denchapan mm. that gym. Um, I like what JP's doing out there. He's absolutely smashing it, and he's uh, got a lot of good level fighters out there. They're fighting at Channel Seven, they're fighting at One Championship. So yeah, they're they're a few to 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 look out for. Absolutely love it, and I know. Uh like I said, those listeners and subscribers to my channel who are really getting into Muay Thai now will are taking notes as they're listening because they're, they're, they're fiends, they're junkies just like myself and they're, they're always looking for the next big stars. So what do you think is holding Muay Thai back from growing in North America? I know recently there seems to be some growth with, you know, RWS being on DAZN, obviously the one Friday fights at Lupini shows every single week that I know even a lot of my friends are getting up super early to watch and and even in North America, I don't know if you heard, you know, Uriah Faber's A1 Combat MMA promotion is starting to add Muay Thai to their arsenal. And actually, just this last weekend, Cage Fury FC launched their Muay Thai promotion as well, Cage Fury FC Muay Thai One. And it, the show, honestly, Lim, was way better than I expected. There were a lot of amateur MMA fighters and amateur Muay Thai fighters. Uh, you know, two and two record guys, four and zero guys on the amateur coming in for their first pro fights, uh, five three minute rounds, and it, it it was really, like I said, blew my expectations out of the water. So there 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 seems to be a little bit of a boost these last couple of years, but overall, what do you think is holding it back here? Well, you had Lion Fight in America, didn't you? But yep. all that all them guys seem to do. I fought on them, and they just tried robbing people of money. That's Scott Ken. That's exactly what I heard too. I heard they just don't <laughs> yeah. pay their fighters. Yeah, but it took me three months to get paid, and That's I only crazy. got paid because yeah. I turned around and said, "Hey, fucking listen, send that money now, or I'm just taking the social media and I'm out in all of you." Two hours later, the money were in my bank. Ah, uh, yes. You know what I mean? And then Tiffany Van Sue didn't get paid. She didn't get paid for one of the Lion Fight fights. Someone else didn't get paid. I've just seen another big thing recently about people not getting paid. So it's clearly been over the years of just kind of been ripping people off. And that was a good, other than the fact that they weren't paying anyone, that were a good level promotion. They got it on TV. They had um, some good high level fights. Kevin Ross were a big star on them for the U, uh, for America. Um, that was decent. And then if they kept like getting more shows like Lion Fight, then more people would have been interested, more people would have been in the gym, more people would have been wanting to do Muay Thai. But I'm guessing out there is a lot like England, more people probably want to do MMA over Muay Thai because they see the UFC, they see all Bellator, all these lot, and they want to be, you know, like that. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a shame that there haven't been any more high-level promotions in a... Uh, in America, but yeah, like you say, if, even if like these MMA ones are getting a few Muay Thai fights on now, that's still going to be getting more eyes on the sport. 
people are going to be like thinking, oh, what's this, this stand-up Muay Thai? And they, they're going to enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed in another couple of years, it just keeps expanding and keeps growing. Well, I will give props to, you know, Scott Coker and trying when he was head of Bellator to start Bellator kickboxing. It only had what, oh, a yeah, year or two awesome. run, but it actually was, it was pretty, it was pretty high level in my opinion. And it just, it hurts my soul to see the fucking UFC go all in on this slap promotion when they could really, they could really be the pioneers of bringing Muay Thai, bringing kickboxing to North America. Like they could, they're just choosing not to. And I know boxing fans said the same thing, you know, that Zufa boxing t-shirt that Dana White wore at whatever press conference years ago. I mean, that never transpired. Um, so, so that's what's sad for me is like the, the big guns, the leading ones aren't taking the initiative and they're leaving it to the smaller promotions. And, and bless their soul, you know, the Cage Fury event was, was awesome, but it's just not going to have the reach and interest you know, it, it compared compared to like UFC and, you know, Bellator back in the day, um, taking the initiative. It's fucking outrageous that they're putting that money into that slap thing. It's, it's so just big, fat fucking geezers who will come straight out of the pub as well. Never, not okay. having to do any sort of training in the life. And they're putting all the money into this slap, slap. What the fuck? Whose idea was that? I don't get it. I, I have no, how, how is it a thing? And when, like you just said, they can be putting on Muay Thai promotions and stuff like that. I wonder, it's like that. Stuff like that almost convinces me that I am 100% right that we are living in a simulation sometimes <laughs> because it blows my fucking mind. I can't get my head around it. No, Liam, you're totally right because I swear it's because they get views on what, like, Instagram and what TikTok, where, like, they have that short attention span and it's like, you know, it's they, they can film it in like a little rectangle so they can put it right on their phones. And I swear they're like, oh, we're getting views. So fuck martial arts. Let's go in on this because it's making us money. And at the end of the day, they're a business. But, you know, I, I'm old school. You know, I trained martial arts as a kid. I did point fighting when I was younger as well. And so I'm always drawn to that traditional martial arts side of things. And that's what I that's why I'm drawn to one. Hell, that's why I'm even drawn to Ryzen. I love what the Japanese do in Ryzen. They're absolute savages. You know, inject soccer kids into my veins all day every day versus yeah. that dude slapping each other in the face right yeah yeah 100 percent, man 100 percent. all right finally uh liam before i let you go here i have to ask considering it, it is your division in one uh how do you think uh the jonathan haggerty and felipe lobo fight will play out and if haggerty wins and uh, no disrespect to lobo but you know haggerty is the favorite do you think nick carrillo gets that fight um i don't even like fucking talking about i get here to be fair such a prick I saw an interview with him the other day. Someone asked me on SMC, STMP, whatever it was, they asked me my opinion on that Nico versus Haggerty fight. And then I saw an interview with Haggerty did with the same people the other day going, oh, Liam Harrison's obsessed with me. He can't beat me himself. So he talks about other people beating me. Blah, blah. He's such a fucking self-obsessed wanker. I honestly can't stand the guy. And that's the thing. Do you know what? Without that belt, someone said this to me yesterday. Someone when well saw that interview. Without that belt, he's nothing because he's not likable. He's just not a nice person. He's fake as fuck. And without that belt, he's nothing. Him versus Lobo, I think he might beat Lobo. Lobo's, I like Lobo's style. Um, I think I get he might be a bit too sharp and explosive for him, though. Uh, Nico Carrillo smashes him to pieces, in my opinion. Nico's tough. He's big. He's humongous. I don't even know how he makes that weight. He yeah, knows how nice. to fight. He knows how to fight as well. Um yeah, that I think Nico beats him. To be fair, but I, I think I get he'll probably beat Lobo. But you can't write Lobo off because I thought Sam and Pitch were about to stop Lobo, then Lobo came back and, and knocked him out. So yeah, it's a uh, yeah. But I think it'd be a tough fight. I think I get might be a bit too explosive and sharp for him though. Hey, fair enough. Okay, I said that was the last question. One, one, one more here because you know I I am a hockey fan and I grew up you know in small town Canada where there wasn't. NHL teams, but we had junior hockey and especially out in Western Canada, we had the Western Hockey League, which is known for the toughest hockey league on the planet outside of the savage Quebec League that people go there just to watch fights and not even not even hockey. Um, are you into hockey fights at all? I've, I've, I've only ever been a one hockey game ever, and that was in Ottawa and there were a fight right at the end and I fucking loved it. That's all I went for. I went yeah. for the fight. And I sat there and I'm thinking, oh, there ain't going to be a fight. And then right at the end, they were a fight and I was buzzing. Um, but yeah, I've seen some some savage ones. 
Yeah, man, back in the day, the 80s and 90s were like the glory years of fighting. Obviously, the world's becoming a little bit more softer. And so even at the National Hockey League level, despite despite fighting actually being up like 40, 50 percent this year, it's still nothing, you know, like what, what I grew up on. And you yes. know, shout out to the English Hockey League out uh, out your way. It is a very tough league, first and foremost. You know, guys who are at the end of their career pros will go there. The big goons who don't have a chance to play and make the yes. millions of dollars in the National, National Hockey League, they go there and become famous for just, you know, smashing nucks. And, you know, after this, I'll, I'll send you on Twitter. I'll send you uh, this new promotion that's out called Ice Wars. Get this. Get this. In, in an octagon, synthetic ice, full hockey gear except for the four-ounce gloves, Two two minute rounds of just swanging and banging, and if it's tied, okay, they the third round. One night tournament, they fight up to three times. It's called wow. Ice Wars. Their third, their third show is coming up next year, and so I'll send you some highlights of that because I, I I feel like that's right up your alley. It's a little bit like it's a little bit fight circus esque, but it's like the Canadian fight circus esque. That's a bit of me that I'll watch that. Send that over. <laughs> that was mental. <laughs> Oh, man. Liam, this has been amazing, man. Again, I really appreciate your time. Quickly, before uh, we let you go, tell us what's coming up for you. Fight seminars, Hitman fight shows again. Remind everyone listening where they can find all that stuff and where they can follow you on social. So I've been waiting for a, a fight day. I finally got one, and then they've tried changing my opponent around. So I don't actually know what's going on with my fight at the minute. Um, We're hoping I'm sex and on. Come on, one. Make it happen. Everyone wants it. Everyone oh. wants it, but... One team obsessed with making me fight John Lineker. No one wants to see me fight an MMA fighter. No one. The amount of people, when I cancelled that fight to go get my knee fixed, because I went to Costa Rica for a stem cell treatment in my knee, the amount of people that messaged me saying, oh, you know what, I'm so glad that fight ain't happening because I said I'm going to watch it just because it were you, but they said I had no interest in it whatsoever. There were so many people. And then when this potential sex and fight could happen, I had hundreds and hundreds of messages of people all in fully invested in it. So, yeah, I, I, I don't understand why we haven't had a contract through for that yet, but fingers crossed that can happen. Uh, if that does, it'll be around April, May time. Uh, we've got Hitman Fight League next show on the 25th, 24th of February. Hitman Fight League, the Road to One Championship. We've got some incredible fights. Uh, and then we've got Hitman Fight League versus CFS, 13th of April. Uh, I've got seminars all over Europe and in I'm coming to South America and Colombia next month as well. So I'm keeping busy. So whether I'm fighting or not, I'll be busy. But I'm hoping, fingers crossed, I'll be fighting April, May. Let's go, man. Well, the keys to the castle are yours, sir. Look forward to catch up again down the road. And uh, yeah, anytime you want to talk fights, if you, <laughs> if you fall in love with hockey fights, you know the guy to talk to as well. All the yeah. best, Liam. And uh, yeah, man, excited to catch up again down the road. Thank you for your time. Cheers, man.